in prehistoric times, human beings lived in harmony with nature. But as centuries passed, human needs changed to greed and soon they started exploiting nature's wealth. Various human activities such as over-exploitation, fragmentation of habitats, introduction of exotic species and pollution have caused a great loss of species diversity. At present, more than 15,500 species worldwide are on the verge of extinction. If we do not take any measures against this loss soon, nearly 50% of species on Earth may be extinct within the next 100 years. However, why exactly do we need to conserve our biodiversity? Imagine a world without birds, plants, or your favorite animals. There are many reasons to conserve our biodiversity, which can be grouped into three categories. Narrowly utilitarian, broadly utilitarian, and ethical. According to the first reason, narrowly utilitarian, biodiversity must be conserved as we get direct economic benefits from nature in the form of food, fiber, firewood, and several industrial products such as tannins, lubricants, dyes, resins, and perfumes. In addition, most plants are of great medicinal value. In fact, about 25,000 plant species are used in traditional medicines by indigenous people globally. Moreover, there are many plants in the tropical rainforests whose medicinal importance is yet to be discovered. What if these plants have the power to cure several life-threatening diseases but are also on the verge of extinction. Currently, most nations are exploring bioprospecting, whereby human resources are used to explore molecular, genetic, and species level diversity for products of economic importance. This means nations with richer biodiversity will probably receive greater economic benefits compared to nations with less biodiversity. Another reason to conserve biodiversity is broadly utilitarian, as it provides major services such as photosynthesis and pollination. Photosynthesis that takes place in green plants initiates energy flow in an ecosystem. Without this process, life on Earth would be impossible. In fact, the Amazon rainforest, also known as the lungs of the planet, produces more than 20% of the world's oxygen through the process of photosynthesis. Will we be able to replace this service by an artificial one? Imagine its cost when an oxygen cylinder costs a few hundred rupees. Another important ecosystem service is pollination, in which several insects and birds function as pollinators. Without the help of these pollinators, we would not have got fruit or seeds. Do you think we can lose such important service providers especially when it affects our survival? Besides all these benefits, we get priceless, intangible benefits from nature, such as the pleasure of watching naturally growing flowers and birds chirping at sunrise. Apart from narrowly and broadly utilitarian reasons, there are ethical reasons to conserve our biodiversity. Without plants, animals and microbes, 
life on earth would be close to impossible. Every species on earth has an intrinsic value even though it might not have a price tag attached to it. It is our moral responsibility to take care, protect and preserve our earth's rich biodiversity for future generations. Whether ethical, narrowly or broadly utilitarian reasons to conserve our earth's biodiversity, the need to conserve our biodiversity is critical. Our planet is inhabited by millions of species of plants, animals and microbes. The distribution of these species is uneven and their groups exhibit various patterns. The most widely recognized pattern of biodiversity is the latitudinal gradient in which there is an increase in the species richness from the poles towards the tropics. Except for a few areas such as the deserts, tropical regions are richer in species diversity as compared to the temperate and polar regions. For instance, Colombia, located at 4 degrees north, has almost 1,400 bird species, while India, at 28 degrees north, has approximately 1,200 bird species, while New York State, at 41 degrees north, has 105 bird species, and Greenland, at 71 degrees north, has only 56 bird species. Moreover, tropical forests have greater species diversity than the temperate forests. For example, a forest in Ecuador has 10 times more species of vascular plants than the forest in Midwest USA. Did you know that the tropical Amazon rainforest in South America has the greatest biodiversity in the world? This rainforest is home to several million species. Interestingly, biologists believe there may be at least two million species of insects waiting to be discovered in these rainforests. But why are the tropical regions so rich in biodiversity? Evolutionary biologists and ecologists have put forth various hypotheses. According to one of the hypotheses, evolution of species is a function of time. In the past, the temperate regions have often faced glaciations. In contrast, the tropical regions have been relatively undisturbed for millions of years. As a result, the tropical regions have had a long evolutionary time for species diversification. Another hypothesis stated that unlike temperate regions, the tropical environments are relatively more constant and predictable. Such constant environments encouraged niche specialization and led to greater species diversity. According to yet another hypothesis, the availability of abundant solar energy in the tropics contributes to higher productivity, which indirectly leads to greater diversity. Apart from latitude, the area of a place too determines the species diversity or richness. A relationship between species and area was proposed by a German naturalist and geographer Alexander von Humboldt while he was exploring the wild in the South American jungles. According to him, within a region, species richness increased with the increasing explored area, but only up to a limit. To analyze the relation between the two entities, species richness and area, he plotted a graph which turned out to be a rectangular hyperbola with the equation S is equal to CA 
to the power z. However, on a logarithmic scale, this relationship is linear and is given by the equation log s is equal to log c plus z log a. From the equation, the value of z can be derived as shown here. A higher value of z suggests that the nature of habitat changes and becomes more accommodating, causing a proportionate number of species to spread across a wider area. In contrast, as the value of z decreases, there is a decrease in the biodiversity of that habitat. According to ecologists, the value of z for small areas ranges from 0.1 to point two, irrespective of the taxonomic group of the region. For instance, the value of Z for birds in California, mollusks in New York State, and plants in Britain are amazingly similar. However, the value of Z ranges from point six to one point two for very large areas such as continents. Interestingly, the value of Z turned out to be 1.15 when the species area relationship was determined for fruit-eating birds and mammals in the tropical forests of different continents. Therefore, in nature, species diversity of a region depends on its latitudinal location and its area. Our planet is home to millions of species of plants, animals, and microbes. Each species has diverse characteristics and features. This biodiversity has been researched for decades by evolutionary biologists and ecologists who still continue to better understand the importance of biodiversity. To begin with, let us understand the term biodiversity. Biological diversity or biodiversity was first coined by an eminent sociobiologist Edward Wilson in 1986. He defined biodiversity as the variation of life at all levels of biological organization. In other words, biodiversity is the variation of life forms found in a given ecosystem, biome, or on earth. Biodiversity is mainly studied at three levels. Genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecological or ecosystem diversity. Genetic diversity refers to genetic variations in a single species as well as between distinct species. At the genetic level, a single species might exhibit great diversity due to its distributional range. For example, you would notice genetic variation in Rawolfia vomitoria, a medicinal plant growing in different parts of the Himalayas. These genetic variations determine the potency and concentration of the active chemical reserpine produced by the plant. This chemical is used to control high blood pressure and to keep psychotic behavior in check. The next level at which biodiversity is studied is species diversity, which refers to the variety of species found in a particular geographical area. For instance, in India, due to favorable climatic conditions, the Western Ghats have richer amphibian species diversity than the Eastern Ghats. While pleasant climatic conditions in the Northeastern states compared to South India have led to a greater diversity in orchid species than those in South India. The last level at which biodiversity is studied is the ecological level. It refers to the difference between ecosystem types, 
and the diversity of habitats within each ecosystem. For example, India has a richer ecosystem diversity compared to Norway due to the presence of deserts, rainforests, mangroves, coral reefs, wetlands, estuaries and alpine meadows. So, how rich is our biosphere? How many species are found on our earth and in India? According to the International Union for Conservation of Nature 2004, the total number of plant and animal species described on the earth so far is a little more than 1.5 million. Some taxonomists believe the number could be much higher, ranging from 20 million to 50 million. But a more conservative and scientific estimate made by Robert May states that the global species diversity is about 7 million. With all these taxonomical studies and species inventories, the exact number of species that are yet to be discovered and described is still unknown as to complete the inventory of the biological wealth of our country and our planet we need many taxonomists and more time. Unfortunately, a large fraction of these species may be extinct or on the verge of extinction even before we discover them. Nature's biological library is on fire and we are running out of time to index the titles of all the books in it. However, the taxonomical studies are more or less complete in the temperate regions compared to the tropical regions. The reason is that tropical regions are so harmonious that they are inhabited by a large number of the world's species. It is believed that many new species of flora and fauna are yet to be explored in these regions. According to recent species inventories, our biodiversity has some fascinating features. More than 70% of all species recorded are animals, while plants comprise no more than 22%. In animals, insects have the largest number of species, and they constitute more than 70% of the total. Interestingly, the number of fungi species in the world is more than the combined total of fish, amphibians, reptiles and mammals. The pie charts shown here represent the global biodiversity of the major taxa, that is, invertebrates, vertebrates and plants. However, it does not provide a count of the prokaryotes of the world. This is because biologists are not sure how many prokaryotic species exist as conventional taxonomic methods are not suitable for their identification. Moreover, many species cannot be cultured in laboratories. But if we consider the biochemical and molecular methods to determine the number of species in this group, their diversity would alone run into millions. Biochemical and molecular methods include direct extraction of nucleic acid samples and magnifying and analyzing the sequences with the help of molecular markers. On Earth, the distribution of species diversity is uneven. The tropical regions are richer in species diversity, while the polar regions have fewer species. Considering the size of our country, which is 2.4% of the world's land area, it is a habitat to about 8.1% of the global species diversity. India alone is home to about 45,000 plants and more than 90,000 animal species. With such species richness, 
our country forms one of the 12 mega biodiversity countries of the world. According to May's global estimates, only 22% of the total species has been recorded so far. If we consider these estimates and apply this proportion to India's diversity, we are yet to discover and describe an astounding 1 lakh plus plant species and more than 3 lakh animal species. We need to preserve our rich biodiversity as it has taken millions of years of evolution to accumulate this wealth which helps sustain our lives and the lives of other species with whom we share our planet. Imagine a world without birds, plants, or your favorite animals. This will be a reality if we do not take any measures to stop the loss of biodiversity on Earth. In fact, experts estimate that nearly 50% of species on Earth might be extinct within the next 100 years. So, how can we conserve biodiversity? Conservation of biodiversity can be done in two ways in situ or on site and ex situ or off site. Let us understand these two methods in detail. In in situ conservation, we conserve and protect the entire ecosystem. In other words, its biodiversity is protected at all levels. For example, to save tigers, we need to save the forests which are home to these vulnerable creatures. Unfortunately, many nations believe that this type of conservation is unrealistic and uneconomical, and so a number of species that need to be saved from extinction outnumber the conservational aid available. To solve this problem on a global scale, Conservationists have identified biodiversity hotspots in the world. Initially, there were 25 biodiversity hotspots in the world, which was later increased to 34. Though these 34 biodiversity hotspots cover less than 2% of the Earth's land area, they are inhabited by an extremely large number of species and a high degree of endemism. The term endemism relates to species that are confined to a particular region and not found elsewhere. For example, many species of Lima are endemic to Madagascar Island. Likewise, the lion-tailed macaque is endemic to the western ghats of India. Our country too is rich in biodiversity, with three biodiversity hotspots, which include the Western Ghats, Himalayas, and Indo-Burma region. Regions with unique ecology and rich biodiversity are legally protected as biosphere reserves, national parks, and sanctuaries. As of today, we have 14 biosphere reserves, 90 national parks, and 448 wildlife sanctuaries in our country. Moreover, Indian religious beliefs and cultural traditions have always emphasized protection of nature. For example, animals such as the elephant and cow and trees such as people and banyan are prohibited from being killed as people think gods and goddesses reside in them. Moreover, in many cultures, trees and wildlife within tracts of forests called sacred groves 
were respected and protected. Such sacred groves are found in the Khasi and Jaintia hills in Meghalaya, Aravali hills of Rajasthan, Western Ghats of Maharashtra and Karnataka, and the Sarguja and Bastar areas of Chhattisgarh. The sacred groves in Meghalaya provide protection to a large number of rare and threatened plants. In this way, we can provide in-situ conservation to many plants and animals in their natural habitat. However, at times, endangered plants and animals need to be taken away from their natural habitat and placed in a special care center. This method of conservation is known as ex situ conservation. Wildlife safari parks, zoological parks, botanical gardens, and seed and gene banks serve this purpose. In fact, many animals are threatened or extinct in the wild, but they continue to live safely in zoological parks. For instance, in India, the population of the one-horned rhino drastically decreased due to destruction of their natural habitat and uncontrolled poaching of its horn. But now it has been specially taken care of in the Kaziranga National Park. In the last couple of years, several advancements were made in ex situ conservation. Now, plants are propagated using tissue culture methods and gametes of threatened species are preserved in viable and fertile condition using cryopreservation techniques. In addition, seed banks are used to preserve seeds of different genetic strains of commercially important plants for a long time. Ex situ and in situ conservation are thus used to protect and preserve our rich biodiversity. As biological wealth is not confined to political boundaries, its conservation is the collective responsibility of all nations. In 1992, the Convention on Biological Diversity, also known as the Earth Summit, was held in Rio de Janeiro, in which all nations were asked to take appropriate measures to conserve biodiversity and sustainably utilize its benefits. In a follow-up, the World Summit on Sustainable Development was held in 2002 in Johannesburg, South Africa. At this summit, 190 countries pledged their commitment to achieve a significant reduction in the current rate of biodiversity loss at global regional and local levels by 2010. Ways to conserve our biodiversity are endless, but it is important that we take earnest measures towards its protection and preservation before it's too late. Life originated on Earth about 3.8 billion years ago, and since then there has been diversification of life forms. More than 1.5 million species of plants and animals have been recorded and many more millions are yet to be discovered and recorded. But how important is species diversity to an ecosystem? Will the absence of a few species really make a difference to the ecosystem? Ecologists have been trying to answer this question for a long time. However, they believe that communities with more species tend to be more stable than those with fewer species. A stable community has the following features. A widespread species with minimal variation in productivity from year to year. Tolerance and resilience to occasional disturbances which could be natural or man-made and resistance to invasions by exotic species. We don't know how these attributes are related to species richness in a community, 
but experiments by David Tillman of the University of Minnesota provide some tentative answers. Tillman marked off hundreds of small plots of grassland, each about a square meter. He then counted the number of prairie plant species in each plot. Some plots were species rich, while others were not. Every year, the biomass of all the plants in each plot was estimated. Plots with more species showed minimal variation in total biomass from year to year. He then concluded that greater diversity leads to increased productivity. We are yet to completely understand how species richness benefits an ecosystem. However, we do know that rich biodiversity is essential for our ecosystems as well as our survival on this planet. Do you think that extinction of some species will affect our life? Would an aquatic ecosystem become less functional if one of its fish species is lost forever? We may not have the answers to these questions, but... Paul Ehrlich, an ecologist from Stanford, tried to answer these questions with the help of an analogy, the Rivet-Popper hypothesis. According to his hypothesis, species are like rivets in an aeroplane, and each species plays a vital role in maintaining the proper functioning of the ecosystem. The loss of one rivet may not weaken the aeroplane, but successive losses in rivets will adversely affect the functioning of the aeroplane. Likewise, the loss of one species in the ecosystem may not hamper its functioning, but the extinction of more species will have a great impact on the functioning of the ecosystem. Moreover, the loss of key species that drive major ecosystem functions will adversely affect the ecosystem. According to the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, Red List 2004, about 784 species have become extinct in the last 500 years, which include 338 vertebrates, 359 invertebrates and 87 plants. In the last two decades alone, we have lost 27 species and recently we have witnessed the disappearance of the dodo in Mauritius, the quagga in Africa, Stella's sea cow in Russia and thylacine in Australia. In addition, three subspecies of tiger, Bali, Javan and Caspian have also recently gone extinct. An analysis of records relating to the extinction of species shows that these extinctions were not random across taxa. For example, some groups such as amphibians were more vulnerable to extinction. At present, there are more than 15,500 species worldwide that are on the verge of extinction. A study on fossil records suggests that our Earth faced a large-scale loss of species similar to the one we are witnessing at present, even before human beings came into existence. Ever since life originated on Earth, there have been five episodes of mass extinction of species. We are currently undergoing the sixth episode of extinction. However, its progress is different from previous ones. The difference is in the rate of extinction, which is 100 to 1000 times faster than in pre-human times. If such high rates of extinction continue, ecologists have warned that nearly 50% of species on Earth might be extinct in the next hundred years. Did you know that the colonization of the tropical Pacific Islands by human beings 
has resulted in the extinction of more than 2,000 species of native birds. Such a loss of biodiversity has several adverse effects on the earth. It may lead to a decrease in plant production due to loss of pollinators and lower resistance in plants due to environmental disturbances such as droughts and floods. In addition, it may increase variability in certain ecosystem processes such as plant productivity, water use and pest and disease cycles. But what is the cause of loss of biodiversity? Sudden climate change and various human activities have accelerated the rate of species extinction. These human activities, which include habitat loss and fragmentation, overexploitation, alien species invasion, and co-extinction, are also known as the evil quartet. Habitat loss and fragmentation is the most important factor responsible for species extinction. The most striking example of habitat loss is our tropical rainforests, which once covered more than 14% of the Earth's land surface and now cover less than 6%. In fact, the process of destruction is still continuing in most tropical forests. The Amazon rainforest, which has the greatest biodiversity on Earth, has not been spared. This forest is also known as the lungs of the planet as it produces more than 20% of the world's oxygen. Sadly, it is being cut and cleared to cultivate soya bean and converted into grasslands to raise beef cattle. Apart from habitat loss, fragmentation of a habitat is also responsible for loss of biodiversity. When large forests in the western Ghats are broken down into smaller fragments due to various types of human activities, it adversely affects animals which require large territories to survive and reproduce and thus there is a reduction in their population. For example, the population of the Asian elephants of the western Ghats has declined due to forest fragmentation. The second major cause of loss of biodiversity is overexploitation of natural resources. For example, many marine fish populations have been overharvested. If such human activities continue, it may threaten their existence. Another cause of loss of biodiversity is invasion of alien species. When an alien or exotic species is introduced accidentally or deliberately into a habitat, it may turn invasive and cause the decline or extinction of indigenous species. For example, the introduction of Parthenium and Lantana on land and the water hyacinth in water has threatened native species. Another example is the African catfish commonly known as Thaimagur and Moi fish. This catfish was illegally introduced in West Bengal from Bangladesh two years ago, which posed a threat to indigenous fish like Rohu and Katla. Another cause of loss of biodiversity is co-extinction which occurs when the extinction of one species results in the extinction of associated species. For instance, the loss of the passenger pigeon resulted in the extinction of its parasitic louse, Columbicola extinctus and Campanulotus defectus. Another example is the case of a co-evolved plant pollinator, mutualism where the extinction of one results in the extinction of the other. For instance, 
Co-evolved plant pollinator mutualism seen in the female bee and the orchid Ophrys, where the disappearance of the bee will eventually result in the loss of the orchid. Apart from all these factors, pollution in habitats has threatened the survival of many terrestrial and aquatic species. We are losing our rich biological wealth at an alarming rate. It is essential to control and prevent the loss of our biodiversity to save our planet.